In July, the country was gripped by widespread unrest. In the chaos, a pesticide warehouse in Durban was set alight. The fallout has caused a major ecological disaster. Rivers turned a luminous blue, fish and crustaceans died by the thousands, and residents who are exposed to the fire's toxic fumes are now wondering if there will be permanent damage to their health. The company responsible, the agrochemical giant UPL, refused to provide answers about what chemicals were stored in the warehouse. So Amabungane went digging. This is what we know so far, told by the journalists involved in the investigation. During the, the unprecedented uh, violence and looting this year in July, um, many, many buildings were targeted by arsonists. And one of these was a, a newly built warehouse occupied by a multinational company called UPL, which deals with uh, agrochemicals. Now, what was different about this fire was that it, it simply could not be put out and that it um, unleashed uh, a cloud of very accurate smoke that covered a large part of the surrounding residential areas, um, which was clearly, clearly not just um, smoke derived from burning building materials. So the first question that everyone had was what was in the warehouse? What was in the smoke that people were being exposed to? And initially we thought, well, we can do a small public good. We can track down the company um, and we can just ask them to disclose what was in the warehouse. When we did that, it became clear though that there was a much bigger problem going on. You know, the company just point blank refused to disclose what was in the warehouse, what was in the smoke that people were breathing in. You know, they wouldn't even use the word pesticide in their sort of first communication with us. Uh, they kept talking about crop solution products. Um, but eventually a version of that inventory of what was disclosed in the warehouse was provided to government. That took, from what we know, about three weeks for government to get hold of a complete inventory of what was in the warehouse. Uh, it took another two weeks for someone to leak us a version of that inventory so that we could publish it and sort of for the first time tell the public what was in the warehouse, what they had potentially been exposed to. So once we had fought tooth and nail to get the inventory of that warehouse, we obviously inspected it and found a truly terrifying list. Um, many of the things stored there are banned in other countries, banned in Europe, banned in the USA, nonetheless available in South Africa. Um, there were known neurotoxins, extremely dangerous ones. There were chemicals known to cause cancer. There were chemicals corrosive to the touch, um, and there were, were many chemicals that seep into the ground and stay there for a very long time, causing damage to the ecosystem. And the question then becomes, how much of this stuff escaped the fire, and how much was incinerated harmlessly? And that is a, that is a question that has not, I think, been answered yet. So in terms of the health effects, there's really two ways in which people have potentially been exposed to chemicals that were in that warehouse. The first is through the smoke, which uh, was coming off the fire as it was burning for about 10 days. People who were exposed to that smoke described it as a kind of choking feeling, coughing and coughing sometimes until they threw up, you know, burning eyes, dry chests. That's really the acute effects of, of being exposed to whatever those chemicals were in the fire. The second way in which people were potentially exposed was through the water, though. In order to put out the fire, firefighters had to use a huge amount of water at the warehouse. That flowed sort of from the warehouse down a hill into a wetland and into the Otlanga River and eventually out onto uh, the Mplanga beaches. Um, what we saw as a result of that was immediately that entire river system turned a kind of shocking bright blue color, um, potentially from uh, blue dye, which was stored in the UPL warehouse. What you saw accompanying that was kind of mass uh, die off of, of fish and crayfish, birds, frogs, things like that. Um, everything that was living in the river essentially dying off um, incredibly quickly. 
Um, that, however, is, again, that's the short-term effects. The question is now, what are the long-term effects going to be? Were people only exposed to enough chemicals that they'll have these short-term effects but no long-term effects? Or were they exposed to high enough doses that there could be long-term effects that may take years to, to show up? So the question has uh, necessarily arisen uh, whether it's illegal for this warehouse to have been there and how it was allowed to be there so close to residential areas and so close to, to sensitive waterways. Um, and the answer to the question is that it may very well not have been legal. Um, there are two regulations you have to comply with in order to, to establish a facility like this. Um, one is that you have to conduct an environmental impact assessment um, and the other is that you have to conduct a risk assessment uh, pertaining to a major hazard installation. Uh, that's in terms of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And UPL did neither and it argues it was not obliged to do either of those things. Um, it has lawyers that support this opinion. Uh, it has not provided this legal opinion uh, for inspection. Um, it is, it's hard to fathom how you could make that argument though. An environmental impact assessment uh, is triggered, the need for one is triggered as soon as you have more than a specific volume of a hazardous material stored in a facility and UPL had several multiples of the, the prescribed um, level in that warehouse. Um, and as far as the, the major hazard installation rules are concerned, again it seems self-evident that having these kinds of chemicals makes <laughs> the warehouse a hazard installation, not least to employees, but also as we now have seen to the surrounding communities and environment. So I, I think they will almost inevitably be some kind of legal challenge and it would be very interesting to see how companies' um, obligations in terms of these rules uh, actually are enforced. Um, I think it also you know, bears considering that the chemicals themselves are legal in South Africa and are imported into South Africa uh, while they are banned in several other countries. And I think, it, I think this incident will help uh, focus our mind on why this is permitted and why we are so lax uh, in terms of what we allow our agricultural sector to import and use on our food crops. Um, so that also obviously is uh, a point to explore in future. This whole story for us was really about accountability and transparency. You know, we just didn't think it was good enough that you have this multinational company that's taken billions of rands in revenue out of South Africa for a number of years, and they weren't disclosing basic information to people about what chemicals they had been storing and what people had been exposed to. We just didn't think that was that was good enough, which is really sort of why we have tried as far as possible whenever we've gotten information on this investigation, whether it's test results, whether it's the, the inventory of the chemicals that were being stored in the warehouse, we've put those up online, we've tried to make them available to people so that they can make those kind of informed decisions about their health and the health of their families. You know, that's really a, a cornerstone of what Emma B is about, is about transparency and accountability. And when we see See, you know, particularly multinational companies just failing to to you know live up to those standards. We just don't think it's good enough, um, and that's kind of why we've been digging and why we're going to keep digging. If you like this video, why not become an Amabungane supporter? Go to www.amabungane.org. Amabungane digging dung, fertilizing democracy.